let's get going, hey? Let's uh, get, get straight into it, talking about students generating uh, <coughs> videos for assessment. This meet, I call this meeting primarily as an informal meeting to discuss it because Lester Jones over in physiotherapy was asking us, asking me, if there were anyone in the faculty who had done this already. So my idea was to call us into a meeting here, those of us who've done it and anyone else who's interested in it, uh, to discuss the pros and cons of it. So hopefully everyone here is prepared to be talking off the cuff about that. Uh, I think, Connie, you might have been the one of the first in the faculty to do it. You asked yep. your students to produce instructional videos, I seem to recall. Yeah. I'll just finish going through the others as well because I know Rick has also asked, Rick and Sabrina, both teaching in, was it Principles of Public Health, you also asked students to produce videos. Paul, I'm not too sure if you've, you asked, you've asked students yet, have you, to, to produce no, videos for assessment purposes? Not to start producing, no. And there are a number of people, um, others from Public Health, um, Carmel and Deb, who, who couldn't be with us today, who've also asked students, and Lindsay. Uh, so, Connie, maybe you could start us off. Um, what, what did it, describe what you did and then take us take us over it. Yeah, so we divided our students into groups and this is for a uh, third year subject, um, a preclinical subject. And we divided the students into groups and we gave them a clinical task to actually develop a video on. And it wasn't actually a single clinical skill, it was a set of clinical skills. And they had to develop um, an instructional video where they assess somebody and then also did voiceover in terms of teaching other students um, about how to perform that um, test. They were also given a time limit, so they had to work in um, an environment that was like a clinical setting. They weren't allowed to take 20 minutes to perform the test. They had to do it in a very specific time frame and if it took them longer, they had to repeat it until they could do it in a timely manner that would be reflective what a practitioner uh, would be able to do and what would be expected of them when they get out on clinical okay. placement. So you, you are setting the time limit not to manage your marking workload but more to mm -hmm. reflect the realistic time frame in which somebody in the clinic would be... Yeah. Okay. okay. But who was and doing the video recording? Did you set up the clinic to do the video recording or did the students have to do their own recording? No, they had to do their own recording. We have prac rooms with the um, clinical um, tools and so they can make bookings at any time and um, record at any time that they um, that they were available. So I actually didn't manage any component of that. And they all seem to be able to find... We have a, a, a small video camera that I uh, in our department which I offered to them but no one utilised it. They mostly used their phones and uh, not asked for anything. Yep. But they, you know, they were very self-sufficient. Okay. Okay. How many students were you dealing with there? So, uh, yeah, usually we're dealing between 35 to 40 students. The next cohort will be 41 students. 41 students. And what year level? Third year. Third year. So fairly mature students or experienced with the, um, the whole thing. Yeah. Had they? Do you know when you first did it? Had they ever been asked to produce video for assessment before? No, they had never been asked. That was did the first time. Little, did they have a little freak out over that? Um, it depended on the students. Some students were really excited about the opportunity and um, looked forward to it. Others were not um, so excited when they heard to broadcast it or, or upload it to YouTube. Some of them were a little bit nervous about that. Um, but we did make it um, optional if they wanted to unlist it um, or make it public. We also got them to complete forms um, uh, to allow anyone who was acting as a patient or anyone who was in the video to allow that to be available on YouTube. Um, the other thing we did, we paired groups together. So we had one group actually doing the skill and I paired them with another group who was supposed to view that video and develop a critique of the technique. And so they were actually presented in class. The one group was on, the other group presented the critique and it was open for discussion at that point as well. Now, Connie, I'm just getting a bit of background noise. I'm not sure if it's from your room or others, but if you think you've got background noise, don't forget to mute your microphone, which is found just at the top of the video screen. There's a microphone crossed out if you think you've got background noise happening. Um, Connie, I'm just looking for... I know I've saved uh, examples of this. Um, I'm going to the Wikiversity page called Using Video, uh, but I'm not seeing it. Do you, can you, would it be, 
quick for you to tell us how to get to, or I'll share my screen and, and get to your um, YouTube channel where we can find these? Yeah, I've actually um, got it on a tab there. Is there an easy way for me to... Yeah, so if you over in the right hand, uh, sorry, left hand side of your screen, just point over and there'll be a bunch of icons that appear. Yeah. The second or third one down the left is a green screen with a right pointing arrow. Yeah. When you click that, a window will pop up asking you what part of your screen you want to share and you've just got to share the browser or full screen so that we can see yours. Yeah. And then you've got to confirm that selection. You select the screen you want to share and then start, yeah, there you go. So now we're currently looking at your Hangouts, now we're looking at your, okay, yeah. your YouTube channel. So, yeah. so we can find it, your channel name is Connie Coquelanis. Yes. C-O-N-N-E-I, -I, so, sorry, C-O-N-N-I-E-K-O-K-L-A-N-I-S. Mm -hmm. um, and we're looking at a playlist of yours yeah. that you've used to collect all your student videos. Yeah. Great. The other thing we asked students to do was to comment on each other's clinical skills, but they didn't do that. It was an option, um, but I found that they actually didn't utilise that mechanism where you can go in on YouTube and make comments. Um, I'm not sure whether that was a bit daunting as well. but Yeah, um, well, let's think about that. Do you think it was because it wasn't an accessible task to do and are they that way motivated or yeah. do you well, think they were daunted by it? The last two years we actually have had it as a hurdle requirement because we weren't too too sure about how to evaluate it and we wanted it to be um, a formative assessment towards looking at uh, how to perform a skill in a timely manner. Uh, but this year we're actually making it accessible and so I'm thinking the uh, type of videos we'll receive will be slightly different. All right, so just to cap, up, um, yeah, cap it off there, because we'll go back to talk about the, the pros and cons of it before we hear from some others on their examples. These are students producing demonstration slash instructional videos um, yes. in groups, in small groups. So there's one, people doing the, one person doing the demonstration, or a group of people doing the demonstration, another doing the recording, and another group assessing their work, all within the same group doing that particular video. Is that about right, Connie? Yeah, pretty much. Okay. So we'll just move to some others to talk about their examples, uh, if they're prepared, that is. Um, Rick and Sabrina, you've, you've, um, you've used uh, or asked students to produce videos for assessment in a public health subject. Could you tell us what that subject was, how many students were doing it, and what was the assessment task? Um, I hope my mic's working. Um, good. Uh, the subject is second year subject, Principles of Public Health Practice. Uh, we've always had a presentation section to that assessment process. Um, usually very good, probably some of the best marks uh, for most people out of the, out of the process. But um, we also had a lot of problems with timing. Some people would go over, uh, some people would miss it, uh, and it, it became a bit untidy and hard to mark fairly because you had different people giving presentations at different times. Um, so some people, if they were later, and maybe three weeks later, had more time. So what we asked them to do was use um, a micro blank uh, product um, to uh, create a video, uh, Windows uh, 7 presentation um, software, and um, to do a five-minute video, which would include uh, visuals as well as text and their voiceover. Uh, I think we got the best presentations I've seen in years out of it. It was certainly a lot more fair because everyone had to turn it in at the same time, which meant that there was a lot uh, more equal distribution across uh, the 60, 70 students in terms of the time that they had. We had some difficulties uh, some people couldn't access the software. Uh, other people uh, had troubles because they do it on one set of software, apply it to another. So probably in future we'd like to see how we can incorporate that into a playlist on Google. Is there a way of actually uploading? Uh, uh, it, it, what they had to do is save it as a Windows movie file. So uh, this conversion software we could have used that had them convert it to uh, a format that we could have distributed. Uh, yeah, yep. I mean, if they upload it to YouTube, that will convert it to MP4. That's right. um, they can 
make it unlisted. I mean, it's a convenient place to put it, but there are other places they could put it and the conversion will happen on the server. So just to fill in a few blanks there, um, the micro blank is the, the Microsoft uh, Rick discovered in our faculty. Um, Microsoft being the Johnny come lately every time uh, has now finally enabled the export to movie from PowerPoint. So you know when you use your PowerPoint and you add audio over the slides, finally after all these years you can now export that as a video file and then upload it to YouTube or you, wherever you need to put it. So that was a good discovery and, and I suppose you went that way Rick because that would be manageable, standardized approach for students to do this presentation? Yes, we, we wanted to think about equity and we also had done some experiments in the last couple of years about asking students to do videos. So we've had some very well produced uh, videos in the past, but the majority of students didn't take up that option. They felt it was too much of a hurdle to work over. Um, so by using a particular widely available uh, software package that basically all you have to do is export it. So you just do the voiceover, relatively straightforward. You can vo uh, voice over each slide or you can voice over a whole presentation and then export it and, and bring it in. So probably we had less than 10%. Um, Jesus is just way too tough and I've had problems and we've had to modify it, which I think is a pretty good uh, you know, outcome to have out of 60, 60 or more students. Yeah. Out of 60 students. Uh, I also think the students were rather surprised at how well they came out. Um, and I think it was easier because it was a, everyone knew it was going to be five minutes of video, ten minutes of debrief. Uh, we didn't have this thing of people, some people going ten minutes on their presentation to shorten the debrief time because they didn't want to have to face up to answering questions. So our assessment with the students uh, was along the lines of uh, did it generate discussion? Uh, and what we did is we said what are the take home messages from this video? So everyone had to come up with three take-home messages, then we'd go around the room and get people to talk about them, and uh, it was quite good. There was a wide range of take-home messages, and when there was doubling up, people could extend or expand upon what they okay. heard. So, so the learning comes from both watching the video, but also listening to the peers. Yeah, yeah, in the room. So you've, you're, in the room. Uh, to, to use a word that's heavily used at La Trobe, you've blended. <laughs> Oh my God! <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> a new so, species has emerged. Adrian, I notice you've got your webcam working, but your microphone is on mute. Um, don't forget, so to speak to us, uh, I'm going to ask you about the examples you you have in dietetics. Adrian, you with us? No, we're not hearing you, Adrian. So we need a bit of setup time. If you hit the, if you put your mouse over the screen towards the top of, the, you'll see a tractor wheel looking icon hit the settings and go through your microphone there. Uh, Rick, just while Adrian's setting up there, um, did any of your students go ahead and put it on YouTube for their own convenience sake? Because uh, Connie's example told them to put it into YouTube. Um, did anyone, do you know of anyone doing that? Uh, there were a few students, uh, I, I cannot, to be honest, remember if it was YouTube, but there were a few students who had uh, online access to their videos but we didn't specify that. In fact, what we specified was put it on a USB stick and yep. give it to us, because that sure. seemed to be the that that seemed to cut out one of the technology skill sets and shorten yep. it down. But people I, did use. Sorry, Connie, jump in. <laughs> sorry, I was just going to add um, in, in reference to that. The first year we ran it, we ran it similarly that they um, actually didn't do it in YouTube. But since then, that 2012 cohort, one of them has actually put that on YouTube. Okay. Um, they were never requested to do so, and that yeah. video has actually had like almost 2,000 hits since it's went it's gone on. Wow. But um, okay. it's the second year that we actually requested students to go onto YouTube. Um, the first we didn't, and we did the same thing with. Um, USBs, the, the size of the videos were complicated for us. It was very difficult to um, share them, which is why we moved to YouTube the second year round. We'll talk about the pros and cons of, of platforms like YouTube and stuff, plus the, the marking workloads, all that sort of stuff. So try, start thinking up all of those comments. Adrian, how are you going with your microphone? Have I put it on the right setting? Can you hear me? Yeah, I, I hear you. That's all right. Yeah. 
so fortunately our students are a bit more switched on than I am. Uh, we used video for the first time last year in a dietetic subject, so students that were in third year undergraduate, first year master's level subject, and they had never done anything with video previously. Never. This was also their first subject that we were delivering in a blended mode, so um, they were faced with lots of new experiences in a subject. And the major project for this that subject was to find, identify a community group, um, determine a nutritional issue that needed to be addressed for that group, and come up with a presentation. And so they actually did a live presentation for their group as the main project, but the video was a documentary. So as part of the assessment, they had a three-minute um, video, which documented the entire process from needs assessment to evaluation of this so, community-based okay. intervention. I see. So the video was supplementary to a live presentation, but the focus was on a live presentation. It, 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 was, it, well, it was a different a different thing, really. So the, the presentation was an education session for a yeah. particular group, and that was live, and they needed to practice their live communication skills. But the video was a documentary, so documenting all of the steps they'd taken. So for assessment to demonstrate that they could go through the processes of a needs assessment, planning, um, development, implementation, evaluation. Um, our students were a bit put off by the idea of video. And they were given the option of doing a 1,000 word paper as an alternative. As an alternative to the video, good. Yep. So they could, they could choose either mode, and probably about half of them produced a video. Okay. With so that option. So we strongly encourage them to do so, and knowing in particular that they'd be doing it in the future, so this year they're having to produce video for assessment. Um, probably the ones that stuck with the written were those that had been performing very well academically on written tests and were very comfortable in that mode. And I think the video enabled the students who nece weren't necessarily as strong academically with written tasks to demonstrate their knowledge, their understanding, their skills in a different way. And those that completed the video generally did at least as well as the written document. Okay, at least as well. Okay. And that's, um, okay, so that's front and center video for assessment in that they were producing a video to show their process of the educational campaign, yeah. not, not what I thought as supplementary. Uh, I'd forgotten actually that because I was uh, close to you when you were designing that assessment. So we've got three quite distinctly different approaches to uh, students creating video for assessment. There might be a fourth in the room because Alex Hayes has dropped in. <laughs> and you're from, you don't forget your microphone's on mute, um, Alex, but I know you have worked with video for well, well over 10 years. Um, mm -hmm. uh, particularly mobile video. Would you give us an example slightly different to the three we've talked about from your experience, um, videos for assessment, student-generated videos for assessment? Sure. Microphone's okay? Yep. Good. Uh, thank you for the invitation, Lee, to join your um, team and your colleagues. Um, I'm sitting here in the Australian National University uh, engaged in a large project which is looking at the participation of Indigenous soldiers throughout all world wars in Australia. Um, I'm also involved as a professional associate through the University of Canberra in a range of projects that look at emergent uh, wearable technology and um, <clears throat> some technologies that perhaps would challenge, um, uh, well I certainly am challenged by them, uh, that are emergent and fast approaching, that being Google Glass and also wearable technologies such as Mamoto, Autographer, and SenseCam. So, so essentially, to, you, yeah, I suppose you're going to go into that, but tell us what they are, Google Glass, Mamoto, they're slightly different, sure. similar. So essentially they are a video uh, connection device as well as creation device. Um, they look like a small, uh, almost um, indiscernible, small, looks like a toothbrush you're basically wearing over your it ear. Does. <laughs> <laughs> um, it looks like toothbrush, yeah. Okay. Yeah. But it, to, to get more information on the technical capacity of it, it's you just go to glass.google.com. Now, essentially, this hangout that we're having now could be glass cast through somebody wearing this device. And what we would be seeing is not us ourselves as the subject. We would be seeing 
if the camera was facing out as to what I'd be looking at, essentially. So this type of technology is part of a 20-year development project by Glass and many other projects um, uh, from an engineering perspective and are fast emerging as being uh, of use uh, within the education and training environment particularly uh, for capturing first-person perspective uh, uh, video assets or um, video connections and engagement with other people that can be used uh, much like we're doing here. They'd be recorded into a mainframe. They can either be made public or private. Uh, they can be shared ubiquitously from device to device. Uh, and they're not science fiction. Yeah, it's actually reality. Yeah, and they've been around for a while. It's, uh, they have, I mean, yeah. The, the, I mean, not just glass, but you know, devices attempting to do what glass is doing. And we've been watching you know, so-called reality television for at least 10 years now based mm. on that wearable um, uh, stuff, but um, yet to see it come into the education sphere, particularly around, um, mm. um, I mean, I know of it going into the mining, police, and even the ambulance sector, but um, in my day-to-day -day work, I haven't seen anyone wonder about point-of-view camera for assessment, point-of-view camera recordings for, for assessment. Yeah. Well, as of last week, Lee, uh, as you'd be aware, I'm involved in a number of projects under NDA that are looking at this development. Um, but yes, last week I spoke with the Department of Education and Training, Commonwealth. Um, 125 people in the audience. It was cast to 1,250 viewers online. Uh, on stage with me were uh, eight uh, young children from year eight through to year 12 uh, at Canberra Grammar School um, who not only are wearing glass every day in class, but they're also developing for glass. Uh, including facial recognition roll call, uh, geolocation for um, creation of um, resources and um, of proof of evidence of having done something, a skill, a task, or an assessment, uh, perhaps, and a number of also interviews and so on that have been conducted from person to person of people wearing that. Yeah, can, so not can only you make note that they'll be our future administrators and managers at the universities, so uh, expect oh, they will. to come. They will, most, most definitely. It was fascinating to listen to the rhetoric of the scenarios and vignettes that they provide as to what they see as the future future paradigm for the way that we the wearable technology will impact, particularly in video and in use for assessment and video and use for evidence for... Uh, not only for statutory information or community policing, but also in terms of evidence and outcomes for learning. So uh, it's a very real phenomenon. It's um, the glass community, explore community was first in the US. It's now right across the UK. Anybody in the UK can purchase the device and engage in the program. All right, the UK can uh, pass the laws on that. Okay. Yes, all of the UK is now flooded with Google Glass. Um, the Australasian region, the Australian Law Reform Commission that I'm advising as well as the Prime Minister and Cabinet Singapore project as well as uh, Electronic Frontiers Foundation and Australian Privacy Foundation are all seeking to ban this particular device outright. But like most things, as we know, that's the very first port of call is it will invade privacy, it will cha change the nature of the way that we engage socially, it will change the way that we inf infrastructures, everything. Um, but at the end of the day, what it is, is a wearable supercomputer uh, on your head that has a very high definition 12 megapixel camera which can take photos, which can operate and can be utilised in a way that could potentially uh, be of benefit for uh, in an education and training environment. It's being okay. used across many industries and uh, I'm involved specifically in the development of not only that particular type of technology but this one here which is in my drawer. It's in the other, other drawer. I'll pull it out in a moment. Essentially, it's a little wearable camera. Little wearable camera. It sits just here, and it constantly takes pictures of everything that I do in a day, and it compresses them into a short video. Uh, and that short video is part of really a digitization of my memory of what I forgot during the day. In time lapse, so it takes a picture every minute or so, and then you get a time lapse of whatever it was you went. It actually about. takes it takes the picture automatically, depending on changes within ambient light, within temperature, within geolocation and time. So those things uh, can certainly, um, yeah, depending on where you are, who you're with, it takes very high resolution photos of the images of people you're with, and so on. 
Uh, it's not a new technology. Um, it's actually being distributed across Australasia again. Uh, people are wearing it. It's not covert. Um, it's part of a social phenomena, much like what smartwatches are becoming, or um, these other devices that people you can buy, Fitbits, any of that sort of uh, data chain producing um, um, device. And but most importantly, in terms of the context of this discussion here, Lee, um, it's something perhaps to consider uh, as part of not really a futures facing. Uh, but also perhaps to look at the currency of the information around uh, where that's happening right now. So I'm very happy, as you would be well aware, Lee, to provide you current case examples today. I can give you links to the team here and colleagues of the 50 glass explorers I've interviewed so they can be horrified by what they hear from <laughs> what's happening socially across that environment. And the social impact is quite colossal. It's having a profound impact on um, in a social context. Uh, and is the focus of the upcoming wearable technology symposium at the University of Canberra in this very area. Okay. Well, well thanks, Alex. I mean, what, um, what is uh, interesting there is that there are, there are four examples to look at. Three of them are different but from a similar perspective in a way, and then the ones that Alex is talking about, primarily the point of view and con continuous recording and all that sort of stuff, is a very different type of data in terms of video as evidence for assessment. Mm. But let's go back to what we've experienced in the faculty um, at La Trobe um, and talk about some of the issues that have emerged from it. Connie, we started off with you. One of the things is um, that I seem to recall coming up was the quality of the video. Was that an issue for you guys, the quality of the video in terms of the student production? In, uh, no, not necessarily. Um, some videos were of better quality than others, and again, I think to some extent it may be that there was uh, it was a hurdle requirement, and, and the fact that there wasn't a percentage allocated to um, the assessment, some students didn't make as great an effort as others. But I think the um, whatever technology they used, and I didn't actually survey whether they used phones or or other um, or other um, techniques. Uh, it seemed to be okay and, and, and quite good, but some students went to that extra effort of um, producing it and editing it um, in a better way than others. So those ones who went the extra step, mm. do you think there's a chance for them to um, get favourable treatment unfairly in the assessment? So you know, remember this is this is a this is a an artifact that we're using as evidence for assessment. So the, really the quality, as long as the image and the sound captures the evidence, but if they polish it more, if they give it music backgrounds and stuff, do you think it's possible, well it is obviously possible, but how would we have some sort of defence, especially in large cohorts where an assessor is giving unfair kind of um, advantage to one group? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I hadn't really thought about that, but I suppose um, if if we have an assessment criteria where a component of marks are attributed to quality or editing, I think you could probably control the bias in some way, and then your other marks are actually related to the clinical skill, the communication, and the other elements that you're interested in within the video. Um, but yeah, I think it would be important to distinguish the amount of marks and the contribution of the quality of the video um, and the editing of it. Having asked that though, I get to wondering about things like written assignments such as the essay format. Uh, those who are good at writing and com uh, composing an argument and may even be a little bit lax in their referencing and, uh, and stuff may actually get away with it because of their compelling writing style perhaps or something like that. I'm just sort of looking for an equivalence uh, in, in more, more traditional forms of assessment. Has anyone else experienced this um, question around quality though? Is the, is the video format quality and all of this range of qualities a um, strong enough method for assessing skills, knowledge, attitudes, values, delivery, um, things like that? Is this even um, is this even an issue need to be considered considering the same can be applied to text? Yeah, Lee, I think I think what you've said is exactly spot on with our students is that our marking criteria was essentially 
the same for our written as for our video documentaries. There was a section on content, there was a section on um, referencing, and there was a section on format or style, whether it's written format or style or video format or style. Um, it's about putting the effort into it, making it um, as close to a professional level as possible. And it's a newer skill for the students, so they probably, for some of them, some of them were, were right and had some skills already, but for many of them, they had to put more work into it, just as a student doing their first scientific report or essay would have to put more work in the first time around. But once they develop those skills, uh, it won't be so much of a challenge down the track. And for our students, it's likely that they'll be needing to use these skills in the workplace down the track, so it's important for them to develop them now. Adrian, thanks for jumping in on that. Do you, do you think the issue, though, is um, also around um, standardised methods of assessment? So exams are standardised you know, and efficient and et cetera. Um, essays are standardised. Um, executive summaries maybe even summarised and a range of written tasks can, can be um, uh, seen as sort of standard that, that generally in our society everyone more or less understands what that standard is, but when it comes to video, it's a little bit up in the air. I, I, I'd imagine it's a little bit, you know, well, what's the standard? Is this an issue for fair assessments? Yeah. So actually, letting the students understand what is appropriate level of presentation and what what effort needs to be put in, and that's probably something that I would think early on is something we might work with the students on developing and an idea of what would be appropriate, and they've probably watched more video content than we have, so they probably have a better idea already, and getting them on board that way might be helpful. Is anyone aware, uh, is there any support area in the university, or this this or another university, so you can, I know where I can go to get support in writing a ref, an essay with ref, appropriate referencing style and stuff, but I don't know where I go in the university for getting support for, for producing a, an appropriate video as evidence of, of an outcome, of a learning outcome. Well, that's, really, that's where we send our students. <laughs> well, all power to me. Okay. Well, then that's on a to-do list then, I suppose, that if, if we are going to pursue video is a viable f data source for evidence for assessment, then it follows, I suppose, that we have the right support frameworks for students in, in satisfying that, I guess. Lee, um, on that point, we were very clear there had to be a mixture of text and and visuals um, and we spelled out uh, what needed to take place in terms of an argument whether it's text or video and for myself I didn't find a great deal of source in the university fortunately as you be aware I have a daughter who works in, as a filmmaker and consulted with her about it I do have some concerns because Yes, young people see a lot of videos. They don't necessarily see a lot of videos that are good in terms of pedagogy, though. And that was the point of uh, my daughter, who teaches in Australia and China, and knows some of the differences between the two cultures. Um, you, you can have very different semiotics in terms of what people are looking for uh, in what things signify and mean. And I don't think we take it for granted that the sorts of things that people need in terms of public health, for instance, are widely disseminated uh, uh, through YouTube or other video sources. Not to say they can't be, but you would know how hard I have to look to find decent uh, YouTube clips already on public health topics. So that's that would be my comment. I suppose to add a point to this issue about the quality of video, is it fair assessment, what are the standards for producing video for assessment, is the two dimensions we've at least dealt with here is data, video data as a form of evidence versus video as a form of communication. So I'm deliberately editing and composing and creating this video for an audience, not necessarily always assessors. So this is more about students generating um, instructional videos or informative videos for a public. Um, and we're assessing the quality of that presentation and the quality of that communication versus here is just some raw video from a camera up in the top corner of the room while I consult with people and you're, what you're doing is you're using that video data source to assess my ability to, I don't know, consult with people or something like that. That's at least two very distinctly different approaches to using video in assessment. 
Yeah, and I think, look, there's, as you again know, I've been looking at the issues around personal learning environments and how this can be developed in terms of remixing and reusing. And I, I think from what I've seen so far is we're really a long ways from being able to uh, standardize uh, some of this. And, and I think part of our role is going to have to be to do a lot of experimenting. And, uh, you know, I've started that blog just to keep track of my own thinking about how this develops. One of my major concerns is that students need to also learn the skill sets and the technology behind all of this so that they're not just limited to whatever uh, commercial group or subcultural group uh, decides is the fad or fashion of the day. Uh, if they're going to be involved as professional practitioners, I think that there's a new d set of skills that they have to develop and be able to work up from. Is it? Would just? I mean, this. There's only so much we can put in. Like, does does this form of communication and data replace another? Because we we have to make some room, don't we? Because we've already filled up a full time student load with what it means to be able to express learning and something. Uh, does video replace anything? The exam, maybe. Um, the three thousand. I'd have. <laughs> in our field, I'd be happy for it to replace exams. Well, it it has already displaced some of the writing. Um, yeah. which means we have to get better at teaching people to write persuasively because as you would again know we've moved to in our subjects increasingly uh, templating writing around funding submissions or policy documents because that's the sort of work that students will have to do in the field they need to not only write an essay they need to which has an argument and evidence for their argument they also have to learn how to do it succinctly within uh, a word limit and within a template uh, increasingly. So I think some of the shift has to, it has to be organic and across the board, but some of it has to recognize even writing has to shift in terms of in public health what that is all about. Mm -hmm. Is anybody in the group considering um, assigning video to assess students? and what their concerns are, if this is the first time they're, they're going to do it. I mean, um, uh, Paul, you may be thinking about it, or um, Mary, I'm not sure if you've done anything like it yet. Are there any questions that uh, remain unresolved in our discussion so far? Uh, I'm just, I'm working with, can you hear me? Yes. I'm working with Connie on the on what she's doing, so um, I'm tapping into that and, and I'll be um, helping her with that activity. Um, so I'm, yeah, I'm not doing anything individually, but we're working as a team to, mm. to try and, and work this out. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, I, just, I just wanted to add in thinking around um, Google Glass, which I never thought about uh, utilising in, um, in assessment or in education, but I can see potential for um, it being utilised in a clinical placement setting where because we're observing eyes, um, actually having the perspective of the student and what they're seeing as they're doing, for instance, examinations fairly close up and looking at the behaviour of the eyes would be actually quite interesting. And it could actually, if you had consent and, and processes in place, you could indeed um, uh, look at replacing um, some components of PRAC exams if students actually utilised um, utilised uh, video in um, and on uh, in pl on placements with patients who consented. So, I don't know, it started, it's just made me start to think about other possibilities around utilising video on placement um, to look at uh, students' techniques. Yeah, that's what I, I thought, yeah. That lapel camera thing um, that Alexander was talking about, I, I thought was really interesting and, and I thought that could have that sort of application. Mm. He's, he's rolled off to find it, I think. it's. Um, <laughs> but, of course, we don't have to wait for technology. The webcam has been um, mm. taken off from the computer for some time. I've just rubber banded it to yeah. my head, <laughs> and um, you're seeing my point of view. But So it's interesting to me and a little concerning. There's, uh, oh, there's the, oh, that's I really tiny, very tiny. Yeah, that will just highlight. Oh, uh, yeah. What are they... There would be a lot of, um, as Connie said, issues in relation to consent in in, the, in a patient um, clinical environment. So um, 
I guess you'd approach that in any other way that you would approach getting consent from patients and, and let them know what you're doing. Like Alexander said, it's not um, covert, it's there. Students would just en enable it or not enable it, depending on whether they had actually received consent for from the patient for using that particular um, piece of technology for their learning. So, yeah. It's not, I don't think that's insurmountable. I've been actually started the conversation with our um, ethics rep research ethics representative here in the faculty about how we could go about getting a. I'll just take this off my head. <laughs> um, how we could go about getting some sort of blanket ethics, but it, I think it was from. Uh, sorry, sorry. I'll just set establish and I think it was from a conversation with um, with you, Mary, about the idea of students working in a clinical setting could put up posters on the wall saying if you have con experience in these conditions and would be willing to be recorded and put onto YouTube and Wikipedia so it was, you know, you're, you're telling them that we were, we're looking for photographic examples of such and such would there be an ethical dimension around that of course there would and have we cleared it by you know, keeping everybody informed and cons um, in that process because then the idea is that students could go in and what we're doing is we're asking students to find people with such such, such a condition uh, and getting a video of that person shows evidence that they could recognize the condition, find somebody, negotiate from them permissions to get a photographic or videographic um, example of that and then put it up on a website as some sort of public contribution. But, I actually uh, have, some, I have some real problems with that. Um, Again, we, you know, we can obviously take pictures of people and we can use these, et cetera, et cetera. But the level that uh, Alexander's talking about of ubiquity means that if if I, as a student, identified somebody with a particular condition, uh, that person may or may not on the spot be able to give actual consent because they may not understand uh, the ubiquity that may be involved. And people may end up finding that uh, and, and again, the reason I'm somewhat concerned about this is I have another daughter who actually spends a great deal of time trolling the internet looking for different sorts of things like this um, to point out how widely something that may have happened in a county sheriff's office like a mugshot gets dispersed across society in such a way that people become recognized. So I, I, do, have, I do have some concerns that I'm not because the other skill set we have to develop is is the ethics of doing this. Just because yeah. it's a social fad, or just because yeah. it's possible, doesn't make it necessarily desirable. And already this discussion's being had around drones in Australia. So I think I think there are privacy issues, and I think there are professional practice issues that we need to address. So you have any ideas, Rick, on how we could approach that? So there's two there's two um, competing um, domains here. There's the need to get better photographic, videographic evidence of such and such a condition so that the wider public can benefit from seeing somebody with that condition and reflecting back on themselves. Maybe there's even a, a further dimension in that, in, in contacting that person or whatever. And then the, the, the in-between part, the proposition I just made, is getting some sort of informed consent between people who have that condition or can offer that photographic evidence and then a student being the mediator of that. And then there's this other one of the ubiquity that you're talking about, which obviously presents um, some serious ethical issues in whether or not somebody can be informed to give consent on the on the spot. Um, is there anything we can do that doesn't stop that potential benefit? Is that even a benefit to get a bigger range of photographic, videographic data? Well, I think there are a number of things, and I don't want to take over the conversation, but going back to what Alexander said, if we go to the indigenous community, you cannot write in a professional journal. You cannot do research as a non-indigenous person, or indeed an indigenous person from another community, about that community without a community reference group approving that, and it has to go through a human ethics committee, meaning of the, uh, a committee of the university, not just your faculty. So there, are, so we already have some experience of dealing with sensitive issues around community ownership of the documents that we produce as academics. So I think there, there's that, and we need to make that that more ubiquitous. We need to develop those skills. But I also think we need to separate out 
it's one thing to say we need to collect data for the public to have better understanding of recognizing symptomology or uh, syndromes, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and, and that's perhaps one uh, set of issues. That's, to me, quite different than students identifying that using an assessment, which I, in some ways, have less of a problem with as long as we do two things sequester the information so it isn't just put up on uh, Google for anyone to see. So we have to have some ethics ar around that. And there's the privacy setting that can, and share settings that could be done. But that has to be ingrained. So as you know, public health ethics is my area of interest. And so allowing people to participate in the processes that determine how their lives are going to be viewed or lived out is essential to public health practice. And it's not just students we have to talk with. I think we have to have a more robust discussion with the larger community about how this goes. Now, I, I don't think that should stop our experimentation within a sequestered environment, but it certainly means that part of our role as health practitioners and public health practitioners has to be setting the fora for that and not necessarily limiting them to specialist or elite groups of people who are enamored of particular elements of technology. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, that uh, the thing that I was going to say about the Google Glass is um, the ability to record point of view camera, point of view video has been with us for a long, long time. But now we're seeing a large number of people show interest in it um, on the back of the glass advertising. And, and that to me is a and I'm not saying Alex is at all that because Alex has been in a point of view um, for, for a very long time, long before glass. So it's natural that he has um, a deep interest in the glass phenomenon. Mm. But it's a little if bit I, of a concern. If I may, the, um, the nature of my PhD focus is on the socio-ethical implications of location-enabled body-worn technology. It's not principally just on digital glass. There's actually probably 10 or 12 manufacturers at the moment who are moving rapidly to develop the, the similar to what uh, Glass for Google is doing. Samsung, Epson, would you believe it, uh, Nokia, and various others. Uh, to me, what I'm interested in is the nature of data sovereignty and privacy, that in a you know, nature of a ubiquitous state, particularly that of the United States, the conversation is not focused on privacy. It's focused on transparency. So engineers who are in the space that I've interviewed, over a hundred of them, none of them consider privacy to actually be anything to do with the nature of the uh, engineering of the device and for what it's actually collecting and achieving. Uh, in, the, in the chat there, I've put a Twitter hashtag, UCGM, and if you follow it backwards, you'll notice that there's a number of medical practitioners who are involved uh, within the nature of using these devices within closed set, within use cases, within wider case trials, and also within public, uh, publicly diffused um, engagement with, uh, with, with their patients or with UCGM1. their... UCGM1. Hashtag. UCGM1 hashtag, yeah. And you'll notice also in there in the chat, and I'm going to have to go now after this comment, um, that I'm engaging with uh, a group of people who have taken glass onto country, as it's called in Australia. They've uh, consulted with elders regarding the particular nature of the device and the way that um, the, the device itself can and has already have had and is having a significant impact on Indigenous communities already in a detrimental way. Um, so if people are interested in either in the Indigeneity First Nations Aboriginal Australia conversation or also the access class in terms of usability and accessibility within a medical framework, uh, there's a number of leads in there to take and I'm very happy to come back in a, a, in a um, Further communication at some point, Lee, if it's of interest to yeah, talk no, you're always about present. those you're projects. Always welcome. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Bye for now. Uh, good luck with your work. Rightio, folks. I think um, we're only just starting to look into the um, the experiences within our faculty and starting to look out to where our contacts are and what they're doing. Um, I hope that this will be a continuous uh, revisiting topic, a topic that we'll continuously revisit. 
uh, as we semester by semester get more and more experience on the um, the question around video as a form of um, evidence for assessment and generally around sort of alternative assessment methods. Is there anything anyone wanted to throw in before we finish up? The additional thing is this was a bit of an experiment too with the Google Plus Communities event. Um, I found that as a, an event organizer easy to easy to set up but I was confused coming into this actual meeting because I went back to the um, events page and looked for my link to join and I couldn't quite see it and eventually I worked out that there was this blue button called start. Rick you're nodding so for a, a guest to the meeting you also found some confusion about how to join the meeting which is... I, had, I, I found two ways in. One allowed me to see other people but not me to participate. That would be the YouTube and then, stream. Yeah. Yep and then I got the, the link and then I had a hell of a problem because for a while there, and I think Connie might have mentioned this, there was a heck of a delay pro loop going on at one point. Uh, so yeah, we probably, probably need a, for us old codgers, maybe a <laughs> big, bigger signs. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, okay. Uh, I don't know, I don't know. It's fast developing space, the, um, the Google Plus and the Hangouts, and every time I look at it, it's different, that's why I'm so confused, but I think the good, the benefit to us is that we're finding a way to take our daily practice into this space so that we know how it works. We aren't distracting ourselves with local um, kind of parochial <laughs> devices that essentially do the same thing. Not that I'm not so enamored with Google, though it does seem. All right, folks, thanks for joining us in this uh, this meeting. I'll send you all the link to the video if you don't get it in other automatic messages. Thanks for your contributions, eh? See ya.